Good afternoon. It's 4 o'clock now, so we're going to get started. Thanks for joining CPD for our webinar, Universal Design for Learning and Accessibility in Higher Education. Today we're pleased to welcome Kirk Benke as our featured speaker. I won't take much more of your time, but I want to mention that at the end of the webinar we'll share a survey link with you. If you can take a minute to give us your feedback, you can get your certificate of participation for the webinar. Um, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Kirk now. Thanks. Thank you, Anna Maria. This is great. Thank you so much. Um, welcome to today's webinar on Universal Design for Learning and Accessibility in Higher Education. Um, the write-up basically today was really to look at how to explore some ideas and some strategies um, how accessibility can be promoted through the framework of UDL. So hopefully um, you all have a little bit of understanding of universal design for learning, but if not, that's okay, because we will be talking about the, the pillars around un universal design for learning, uh, including lunar variability, as well as some of the cognitive neuroscience around the UDL language. Um, we also want to talk about the accessible pedagogy uh, around the framework and how faculty and staff could incorporate accessible design elements within um, their curriculum and also as well as within their learning environments, whether that be um, a live classroom or in um, an online environment. We'll also have a time for a short question and answer period. Uh, I also have a few uh, resources that I would like to share as well at the end. Um, but if you do have a question, um, feel free to type it in the chat window um, and hopefully either myself uh, or Anna Maria will be able to um, interject and will be able to, to read it and address it at that particular time. So again, welcome so much for coming. Uh, welcome to this webinar today, and we look forward to hearing from you. Again, my name is Kirk Benke, and um, this is sort of my, I guess, splash page if you want, just to give you uh, pictorial uh, information about who I am what my experience is in the area of assistive technology as well as uh, accessibility. So initially I was working for um, United Tribal Palsy of New Jersey and then I went to uh, the Temple University where I was a um, project manager there for the Pennsylvania Initiative on Assistive Technology and I also ran an AAC uh, training, uh, two-week training camp uh, at the university itself. Um, then I went to California State University, Northridge, uh, in um, beautiful, outside of beautiful uh, Los Angeles right now, and my thoughts go out to the people in LA uh, as we um, do this webinar as the fires just continue to ravage that area, and I feel so bad for many of my friends that are out there, and hopefully everything will be fine, and those, those winds will die down, and the, uh, the fires will die down as well. Um, then uh, what I did was at California State University was I worked and developed the Assistive Technology Application Certificate Program, which is a certificate program in the area of assistive technology, uh, 100 hours of online instruction as well as providing face-to-face uh, -face instruction. And I do see a few ATACP graduates um, in the participant list today, so a big shout out to um, those of you who are ATACP certificate grads. Um, then I went to the Region 4 Education Service Center uh, in Houston, Texas, and I was also the lead for the, um, hey Mike, and I was also the lead for the uh, Texas Assistive Technology Network, where I led uh, education service centers in the country of Texas uh, in the availability of assistive technology. Um, then I'm currently working at CAST, uh, and the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials. And I have done quite a bit in the area of providing uh, universal design for learning training as well as AIM training. Um, and then I also privately I have worked for MATA in um, Qatar and helping them develop their assistive technology center and also around universal design for learning in AT and also in Singapore as well as in uh, Oman. And um, also, I am a graduate from the Harvard Graduate School of Education for their Universal Design for Learning course uh, back in 2009. So that's kind of me in a nutshell, um, but you're here to uh, learn more about um, 
accessibility and un universal design for learning. Um, the, the question is, what is CAST? CAST is a Center for Applied Special Technology. Um, they're the ones who kind of coined the term universal design for learning, and I'll be referring to them uh, as well. So the agenda is really looking at some concepts of UDL, including learning variability as well as cognitive neuroscience. Then I also want to go over the sort of federal definition of accessibility. Then I would like to incorporate some accessible design uh, in higher educational settings with a few examples um, that actually are examples from a great resource, which is um, online higher education um, that actually is sponsored by CAST. It's UDL on campus. Um, so if you have an open window, if you wanted to go on udlcampus.cast.org, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, and I know that some of some of you might not just like listening to my voice, and you need to do something else to occupy your time. I get that. Um, that's part of Universal Design for Learning. So feel free to know more about that. But we also will go over a few more uh, resources at the end of this webinar. And then we'll have a question and answer, and then, of course, that resource sharing. So let's go over a few concepts of UDL. Oh, first of all, I think there was a poll. Anna Maria, did you have a poll of who is actually here on the, on the, um, on the webinar? If you could bring that up, great. So basically, who are you? Um, if you're a teacher or faculty or higher ed admin, we'd like to, to, to know who's actually here. So thank you for filling that out, and I'll take a few seconds to do that. Okay, it looks like we have most of you are faculty in higher education, and you're also higher ed admin, which is perfect because that's what this uh, webinar is about. But some of a uh, good percentage of you are also service providers, and so I'm going to end the poll. So I, I uh, do appreciate that um, for your input. So that helps me out a lot. All right, so let's look at the concept of UDL. For those of you who are un unfamiliar with universal design for learning, um, let's take a step back and just kind of look at the history, if you will, of access, universal design, and, of course, universal design for learning. So in 1975, there was this thing called the EHA, which is the Education of the Handicapped Act, and that basically gave uh, students attending public schools access to their um, neighborhood schools. So kids with disabilities weren't shipped away anymore to either residential facilities or things like that, they were actually given opportunities to attend their neighborhood schools way back in 1975. That was sort of like the, um, the birthplace of inclusion, if you will, within the school system. Then IDEA came along in 1990, if any of you remember 1990. Um, that really was a huge legislation in looking at Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and looking at how kids with disabilities would be given not only access to schools, to their neighboring schools, but also access to their peer classrooms. So in other words, really not having all of our kids who happen to have special needs out in the um, out in the temporary shelter, uh, you know, next to the, the field, um, the playing field, or the um, outside of the campus, but actually within the classrooms itself. And then in 1997, IDEA was reauthorized with looking at how we could provide access to general education curriculum. So it wasn't so much that anyone else was going to have access to the classrooms, but also access to the general education curriculum. So what every, all the kids were looking at um, in the uh, classrooms that we had kids all the way in the back just with a, a personal care attendant or a, a, a paraprofessional, but they weren't doing the same thing as everyone else was doing within the classroom itself. So that's why IDEA reauthorized with giving access to the general ed curriculum. 
And then in 2004, the whole idea around access to instructional materials. So sometimes there was the problem where kids were given access to the general education curriculum, but there was not um, the alternate formats that were needed or the technologies and or in digital materials that were available to the students in order to gain access to the. And then in 2008, and this is kind of imperative to this particular group, is the Higher Education uh, Act. And looking at how um, the, the Higher Education Act not only provided access to UDL, but also the definition and then some universal design provisions. And we're going to go a little bit over that um, in more detail in just a second. Then also we had um, the ESSA in 2015, which was access to universal design for learning. And that was imperative because it was around how UDL has been actually in a policy um, and being regarded uh, as an instructional um, process um, and also the, the actual definition of what is universal design. And then also looking at it from its four pillars of materials, methods, um, assessments, as well as, goal, of course, goals. So um, that's a little history uh, in regards to access. But universal design is really looking at architectural design. Um, and then universal design for learning is applying that UD uh, principles to actual education and learning. So UDL from the CAST perspective, uh, from their definition in 2019, is a framework. So it's a framework for proactively designing flexible learning experiences so, that's, so that from the beginning that enable all students to gain knowledge, skills, and enthusiasm for learning needed to be expert lifelong learners. So that's sort of like the capture elevator statement of what is UDL. So when we look at universal design for learning, we're not just looking at kids with special needs. We're actually looking at all learners, and specifically of including those marginalized learners that may or may not be in our classrooms. So those who are um, maybe from a special education point of view, or even some just struggling readers and writing uh, students uh, within our classrooms, that the framework can apply to them as well as from the other side, those gifted and talented students. And again, we're going to find these students that may or may, may exceed in some content areas and may need supports in other um, content areas as well. So we are all you know, not um, proficient in all areas of our content as we move forward. So UDL is really a framework which encourages proactive design in curriculum and learning environments. So here's a picture that I have up here on the slide, which is basically a building, a uh, school building that has a, a ramp and a set of stairs, and there's a maintenance person on the set of stairs and a bunch of students at the bottom of the, the, of the picture. The, the, the um, the maintenance person is, has a shovel in his hand, and he is actually shoveling away snow off of the set of stairs. There's a kid in a wheelchair in the bottom left-hand corner, which asks, could you please shovel the ramp? The maintenance worker says, all these kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I will clear the ramp for you. And the kid in the wheelchair says, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. And this is a great metaphor for what is universal design for learning. Whereas the, it's more access to the curriculum through a ramp situation as opposed to having a set of stairs and also a ramp. If you build it from the beginning uh, with design, good design in mind, then everyone can get in through the doors with minimal effort. Um, so that you can have a set of stairs and a, and a ramp, but why have both when a, set of, when a ramp that's designed from the beginning can give access to everyone um, up front. So when we talk about universal design for learning, we really want to talk about another concept about using and designing flexible learning experiences. So as we look at learning experiences, I'm, I'm depicting um, three um, pictures up here um, in revolving a building and earthquake. So when we design flexible buildings, 
to remain standing during an earthquake, we can look at the first picture, which actually uh, is a rigid framed building that has no supports or structures. And when the earth shatters or the foundation pieces start to shake, it crumbles. In the second picture, when we have the earthquake adapting, the, the building is flexible in design. So it actually waves in the area up and down. Uh, and then on the third, we have actual pillars on the bottom of underneath the building itself where the building will actually roll. And so this is a great metaphor of, of designing flexible options within the design of the building and or curriculum itself. And that way, you have flexible options for everyone. Another uh, metaphor here is I have a uh, picture of a storefront that says one size fits all store and there are four animals in front looking in the, the window. We have a large elephant, a tall ostrich, a smaller turtle, and a snake looking into the building, into the window uh, of the storefront. So. The whole premise here is that one size really doesn't fit anybody. So when we look at UDL, we want to help educators consider that learner variability uh, proactively um, can really help uh, uh, influence design curriculum and lesson plan. So again, if you plan for those kids or students within the margins, you're planning for all students. Um, one of the last slides that I would like to talk about is this equality versus equity um, images. And in the first image, we have three different uh, height boys standing on the same box looking over a wooden fence to a baseball game. So in the first image, we assume that everyone will benefit from the same supports of the one box to see over the fence. Uh, and they are being treated equally. So the tall boy, of course, with the one box is really looking over the fence. The mid-sized boy with one box is just looking over the fence, where the shorter boy with one size box is not seeing anything, um, where he's not actually um, reaching his goal of seeing over the fence. In the second image, we see that individuals are given different supports to make it possible for all of them to have equal access to the game. So the tall boy is not given any supports or boxes. The middle, the middle boy, the middle-sized boy, is actually given the one box. And then the third, the shortest boy, is actually given two boxes to stand on so that they all can reach their goals. And they are being treated equitably. Um, and this is a very great similar um, case of special education now as we look at accommodating those with specific needs, where we supply the needs and our supports for those who have an IEP or for those who have a um, education plan or whatever the, the course might be that we, we sort of retrofit everything so that the boys or the students or whomever uh, can reach their goal and we supply that. But universal design for learning actually looks at it differently. We look at reducing barriers. So why don't we just take the wooden fence away, put up a chain link fence, which actually does the same thing of safety, if you will. That's the major goal of that. But we don't have to provide any supports to any of the students because they're not needed, because the barrier is actually taken away. So what I'm saying and what Universal Design for Learning is saying is that we need to look at our environments and our curriculum and try to identify barriers that exist within the, the um, curriculum or, or environment itself rather than concentrate on the students and accommodating the students first. Um, we, we can see that that's sort of like a, a, definitely a change and shift of how we look at education, uh, whereas really the, 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 um, the onus is on the um, learning environment and the, and the um, professor and or lecturer to really look at how they can provide uh, different and design different um, ways of access to the curriculum and providing flexible options to those goals. So in, in, cap, in um, summary, we want to look at universal design for learning through these four pictures, if you will. Um, reducing unnecessary barriers in instruction, encouraging proactive design within curriculum development, 
how we can afford flexible options for students to learn mastery of that content. And also we want to assume learner variability. Now I call about learner variability in that, in that instance and really look at how, um, what, are, what do we talk about when we talk about learner variability. So let's go to the next slide. Are there any questions? Okay, not seeing any. Okay, so let's look at some cognitive neuroscience um, around universal design for learning. Um, I want to uh, reference Vygotsky's three prerequisites for learning, which is actually the basis of universal design for learning, looking at the um, three areas of uh, how individuals learn. And how individuals learn is really around their um, brain networks of learning, um, the effective network, the recognition network, and the strategic network. So what I have here on the slide is three columns with those, um, those titles in each of the column. So the effective network is really about the why of learning. You know, how can we engage students in that why? The purposeful, motivated learners, how can they stimulate interest and motivation for learning? Uh, and that's our overall goal, is looking at how we can get um, learners to be, um, to be motivated in, in their learning. Um, so when we talk about the effective network, at the core of the brain, you know, lies networks that are responsible for that emotion and effect. So this core neither recognizes nor generates those patterns per se, but however these networks determine whether the patterns we perceive matter to us and whether they are important. They also help us decide which actions and strategies to also pursue. They're not so critical in knowing how to recognize a cup of coffee, but in knowing whether the coffee is important to us at the moment is part of the effective network. The recognition network, or the middle column of what we're talking about today, is looking at how we represent or providing multiple means of representation. How do we recognize that material? So within the recognition network, we look at you know, the posterior back of the brain's cortex, and that's devoted to really recognizing patterns. And recognition makes it possible to identify those objects and events in the world that are basis of the visual, the auditory, the tactile, olfactory, all that type of stimuli that reach our receptors. So for example, through these networks, we learn the distinctive patterns that constitute you know, a cup of coffee, a book, um, a dog's bark, or the smell of burning leaves, or the smell of smoke, um, for that matter, as we talked about, you know, LA. So that's kind of like the recognition uh, network. And then the strategic network is, again, the how of learning. Um, now these are areas of the brain that underlie our ability to plan, to execute, um, to monitor, um, all those skills, and also those actions. And so they include those areas often referred to sort of as executive functioning. And for those of you in special education and um, have served uh, students with special needs, you know that this is a huge part of um, executive functioning. It's a huge barrier, if you will, for some of our students. So really that anterior part of the brain, the frontal lobes, you know, primary com com primarily comprises the networks responsible for knowing how to do things. You know, such as, you know, holding a pencil, riding a bicycle, um, reading a book, um, reading instructions, um, planning a trip, you know, or in this example, again, brewing coffee. Maybe brewing coffee or how to get a cup of coffee. Um, do we go to our local barista or do we ask somebody else um, for a cup of coffee, whatever. So those action skills and plans are highly patterned activities, and that requires frontal brain systems to really generate those patterns as well. So as you can tell, you know, with cognitive neuroscience, it's really, you know, not only is the matter of the autonomy of the brain, the anatomy of the brain, but also how these networks interact with each other in order to um, do what they need to do in order to learn. So that's the cognitive neuroscience behind universal design for learning. When we look at the universal design for learning guidelines, um, we break up these particular you know, principles, which are multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and then multiple means of action and expression. And under each one of those principles, 
we have those goals of engagement, we, provide, we want to um, produce purposeful and motivated learners. Under representation, we want to produce resourceful and knowledgeable learners. And under action and expression, we want to produce strategic and goal-directed learners. So within each of these um, principles of universal design for learning, we also have guidelines that um, support each one of those principles. So for example, under providing multiple means of engagement, and I'm working up from the bottom here, is provide options for recruiting interest, provide options for sustaining effort and persistence, and then provide options for self-regulation. So within that um, UDL principle of engagement, those are the guidelines, made guidelines, that support that effort. Now as we look at these guidelines, they are directed um, in a way that from the bottom, from the bottom, I guess, column, when you look at this, um, when you look at the, this infographic, um, you want to look at how what is teacher directed, which is the bottom um, row, and then the middle row is really looking at teacher and and uh, student learner um, interaction, and then at the top is really about learners and how they can provide, let's say, for example, in engagement, provide options for how they can self-regulate, or under representation, how they can provide options for comprehension. So this is how the universal design for learning guidelines uh, work and how they're um, used. So that's enough around UDL. Let's talk about accessibility. So when we talk about the term of accessibility, we're really looking at the term that is defined by the Office of Civil Rights, the U.S. Office of Education, um, when a person in, with a disability is afforded the opportunity to acquire the same information uh, engage in the same interactions, and also enjoy the same services as a person without a disability in an equally effective and equally integrated manner and substantially equivalent ease of use. So that's uh, definitely our um, definition here around accessibility, is looking at how we can afford those opportunities. And I'm going to go to the next slide to give you another option because in providing good universal design for learning, I want to provide you with multiple means of representation. So when you look at that um, first slide that I just read off of, now you can see in a more graphical interface is what is the function and definition of accessibility. And then it provides students the opportunity to, in those three areas of acquiring the same information, engaging the same interactions, and enjoying the same services, again, as a student without disabilities, uh, with a substantially equivalent ease of use. So for some of you, um, there's the way that you can orthotically get that you know, through written language. And then others might need to have some support in looking at that in a different way um, visually. When we look at UDL and accessibility, we really look at how um, these guidelines can work themselves together um, and provide uh, flexible options and support for all users. Users, And as we know, when we look at accessibility and basically that um, definition of accessibility, it really depends on what is accessible to you and what is you know, in that particular um, arena or venue, or what's your, your specific task that you need to do. And I'll, I'll go over a, a little information about that. So really, the purpose of education is not to make information accessible, but rather to teach learners how to transform accessible information into usable knowledge. So as post-secondary institutions, we are obligated to provide that accessible learning materials and technologies for students with disabilities. But UDL is more than simply providing information in accessible ways. And I hope you kind of get that through at least the ma three major principles of universal design for learning, which I shared earlier. But there's definitely more information coming that will hopefully help you with your application of this knowledge. Um, OK, so let's go ahead and start. Uh, I'd like to show you um, a video from UDL on Campus. Um, which is available at udloncampus.cast.org. And I have the actual website down there in the bottom, but uh, I'm just going to show you the video, and I will hopefully um, 
the audio will come through. And I believe it has captions on it. I think it does. And um, one second, and we will get going. Accessibility is one of the key foundational principles of universal design for learning. And it's a component of universal design for learning, but is not by itself universal design for learning. We always think of it, the way we sometimes phrase it is that uh, accessibility is uh, essential but insufficient on its own to be universal design for learning. Um, accessibility is really uh, captured in the first principle of UDL, which is multiple representations of information. And from an instructional perspective, uh, it's our old mantra of you can't reach them, you can't teach them, uh, that information has to be accessible and presented in a variety of ways, audio, print, tactile, uh, graphically, by video, as many possible ways uh, as there are to make sure that people can get the information they need. Whereas UDL really expands beyond that and talks about action and expression, how people uh, exhibit mastery, how they can express their achievement, how they can really articulate well what it is they know. And then the third principle, really thinking about engagement, how we engage learners to uh, enforce and enhance their persistence uh, in ways that uh, really can support them in the face of challenges. So that was Skip Stahl um, talking about um, the intersection of accessibility and universal design for learning. In the chat room, I did put in the link to that um, video directly, which also has a transcript. Um, and then if you also wanted to go on YouTube, on UDL, uh, uh, on campus, um, there is a, a captioned version as well um, uh, as you looked. I saw that some of you had some echoing, uh, et cetera, and um, some of you that worked just fine, so I'm sorry that you had some audio issues. But let me just recap um, what um, was said. If we could stop share that. Sorry. OK, so if we could, um, here are some of the key things that uh, Skip Stahl, one of the founders of um, CAST, um, talked about is that accessibility um, is a key to foundations for UDL. And he also said that accessibility materials, uh, accessibility of materials um, are captured in multiple means of representation in that, in that particular guideline, which happens to be you know, the middle guideline uh, on this page, and the purple guideline. But uh, I know that UDL also expands accessibility in also the multiple means of action and expression, the blue column, and then also multiple means of engagement, the green column. So, um, and I'm going to be giving you a few examples of how that has worked for um, in, a, in a particular case study that uh, has been available on UDL on campus. So let's look at ed accessible educational materials. You know, first of all, you know, what's being given in class um, or what's being handed out to students? Um, is it the, um, you know, the, the worksheets or if it's the um, syllabus or whatever the things might be given out in class? is that accessibility is not one thing, you know, or even a set of things. It's a matter of looking at accessibility within your own learning environment. Usually when I have done um, this type of presentation in a face-to-face um, -face learning environment, such as Harvard or um, at different types of higher education institutions, I kind of ask the students in the beginning, first of all, how did you get here to the class? You know, what are some of the ways that you got to class? Well, some of them drove their own car. Some of them took a bus. Some of them walked um, from, you know, their dormitories or from the student center. And then I ask, you know, if you had different abilities, how did you get here? Um, did, you know, did you take uh, a whole accessible 
pathway to this classroom? Did you take stairs? And were there other op options available for you if you had a mobility impairment? Were you able to uh, get into this classroom? Uh, and then once you got into the classroom, is it about, you know, um, well, if you're in the classroom, is it still like a stadium style seating so that you, if you use, if you had a, a mobility uh, impairment, you're only allowed to have access to some part of the classroom? You know, or were you given, given access to, you know, every, all of the classroom? Or if you have a visual disability um, where you're sitting by the window and the sun coming into that window is actually impeding your view of either the board or what's being presented in the classroom. Uh, again, that accessibility is really a moving target. It's a moving target for all of us. Not just a matter of preference, but it's also a matter of accessibility. So for some of us that have different types of disabilities or conditional disabilities, um, we do have to take that into consideration. Um, our faculty and administration of higher educational settings, they need to understand that too, that we need to build in more flexible options and seating and um, you know, materials that um, we need to then apply for our students. And then again, is it accessible to whom? Um, so uh, in, in other words, if somebody has a um, disability that they cannot see or, um, you know, black print on white paper, but if they are able to use some type of lens or colored paper um, with a colored background and that, uh, that's available to them, why couldn't it be just available to everyone? Um, and I've seen actually under, um, K through 12 settings actually do color coding of within grades to say that okay all math sheets will be on yellow paper all English pieces will be on green paper and that's just helping with not only um, executive functioning but it also helps with getting kids a little bit more organized from from a very young age um, and then is it accessible where so for example if you have some students who might not be able to attend class. Um, a classroom environment uh, on a campus, are they able to, you know, um, zoom in or, you know, uh, see the, um, the lecture remotely? Um, we have that technology. It's just a matter of how we can, you know, get it uh, into play and how we can utilize that uh, in an effective and efficient manner. And then it's accessible for what? Uh, again, taking that um, some of you probably heard about this, but the SET framework, which is um, by Joy Zabala, looking at the student's needs first and foremost in that environment for that specific task, and then you look at the tool. So how can, you know, these types of accessible educational materials um, be available uh, and then be produced and designed for each individual within your classroom. It takes a lot of work, but once you figure it out up front, more than likely you're reducing a whole ton of barriers for a whole bunch of other uh, students within your classroom. To, go, to know more about accessible educational materials, you can always go to aim, A-E-M dot cast, C-A-S-T dot org. Um, and you can find out more information uh, and resources on how to get gain things uh, more accessible um, and, and around materials. So what I like to talk about now is this blog post uh, that was on June 4th of 2017 from Access Lab. And basically it was from a um, tweet that actually was uh, sent out by um, someone um, where they asked um, specifically if you have a disability, what's the hardest thing about browsing the web? Okay, so a real generic question that was asked. And what happened is that they did a, the Access Lab did a little research um, and had some responses. And the um, article there is in that um, um, is in the window itself, but I'm also going to put that in the chat window. So if you wanted to view this um, research, you can. But I'm going to sum it up here is that a lot of the um, people who responded to this tweet were some of the top accessibility concerns were lack of captions on video. And that's not only open and closed, but also audio descriptions. You know, how can audio described videos um, be um, pretty um, effective for a lot of our students who are blind or visually impaired. 
Um, another point was motion, animation, and cluttered pages. Look, looking at things with too much information or cluttered or animation that scoots across, this can be very distracting. And also just walls of text. Just looking at text and not any white space or any margins or things like that, that's very um, obtrusive to someone learning. Small font size on the web is also um, sort of an obstruction for many people. Zooming problems or the laying out of materials. There's also the low color contrast and images of text and then small targets within um, um, websites themselves. <clears throat> and all of these different types of um, top accessibility concerns are interesting because many of the technologies that exist today can alleviate 90% of these accessibility concerns if it's designed within the web page itself. So there's some plenty of great examples that have web browser, um, screen readers within their, their websites themselves, and also Zoom capability. Also looking at different ways of using web browsers uh, to help with color contrast and changing filters um, of web pages. Looking at how we can um, reduce motions and animations. Um, so there's a lot of technologies that are out there right now um, to address quite a number of these um, problems uh, that students have become more aware of. So what I'd like to give you is a couple of examples in um, uh, around uh, universal design for learning and how educators have used the UDL lens to help support all of their students within their classrooms. So this is from um, East Carolina University. And the course is Instructional Leadership for Teaching and Learning. And the professor is Dr. Marjorie Ling Ringler. And she identified challenges within that face-to-face -face classroom. The, then he, these are three challenges that she um, came up with. One is unable to understand how theory translates into that practice. So how does she take um, theory? And then how does she incorporate that into a practice model for her leadership class? Then also the lack of um, opportunities to practice those leadership skills needed to become an effective principal. So it's not just a matter of giving homework to the students, but how can she um, provide different opportunities to practice those leadership skills? And then the third one was lack of student engagement in lecture style classroom. Well, because you know of her lectures and what she was doing, um, there wasn't so much engagement from her participants, from her um, um, learners within the classroom. So um, she really wanted to look at UDL and how that could address some of uh, three of these issues. Excuse me, one second. Okay. So UDL strategies that would address these challenges could be, you know, under the effective network, again, looking at that um, emotional side of how we learn, the why of learning, we can provide multiple means engagements through um, heightening interest and support and progress monitoring. What she did was she used service learning projects uh, and group work that would enable uh, more engagement among the students to sort of have their own projects and um, work together, uh, group work from learn learn from each other. She also asked students that, that to provide feedback feedback um, for every class and have them complete weekly personal reflections. So about their learning, um, I think that what they could do, you know, uh, every time that they meet, if it's weekly professional reflections, you know, even through the process of of how, of providing information. Um, re personal reflections are so essential to learning because that's when the rubber hits the road. That's when you apply the knowledge that you've gained and how will that they, they use that information um, to their benefit and actually include that within their next um, um, ideas or strategies of that. Um, she also took physical space um, within her her um, lecture room, which was set up as a lecture hall, um, she was able to find another room on campus that actually afforded this type of group work. So she had three sets of pods um, with six um, people at a pod. Uh, and then she also had smaller pods of two and, f two and three um, individuals that wanted to work together. 
And what she found out was that when she implemented sort of just this physical arrangement of space where, where students were looking at each other, um, that that actually helped with um, behavior of their, not only the students, but also the instructor in how they interacted with each other. So um, she was even surprised um, by being unable you know, to keep that, uh, by, 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 keeping that inf by keeping that classroom arrangement, that she was able to then become less lecture and more interactive um, within the uh, inf within that physical space. So um, she says when she moved from a traditional room to one room with those round tables, she lectured less and walked around the tables more, you know, and got feedback from individual students. Um, and what she said is that you know she thought that space was just you know neutral that wasn't really um, a meaningful part of information, but yeah. It's about um, that it can really affect um, the way that students um, are engaged within the material and the curriculum. But it's not just a space, but you also have to have um, good information and um, strategies, reflections, um, posing questions, information activities, all of those things that, you know, as good teaching we should do. Um, Someone said a U shape is great. You know, just again, the U shape is good, but it all focuses again more on um, the middle of the room and the lecture and the person presenting or the facilitator. Uh, I'm not saying that's not a bad that's a that's a bad idea. What I'm saying is that it also depends upon your activity and your lesson of what you're trying to do. Um, so it could be a U shape at one point in time. It could be pods. It could be everybody sitting on the floor. Could be a great field trip, um, you know, to to do something um, in regards to um, supporting a lesson. Um, another UDL strategy that she addressed was through multiple means of representation. Again, looking at that recognition network, um, the what of learning, and how do we provide multiple means of representation? She provided. Uh, to, in order to support the processing of information, she used multiple forms of media, including captioned and audio described videos and simulations. So she was able to find some um, videos, other videos that she used that actually worked out better on her behalf when it talked about teacher leadership um, that, that happened to be captioned. But then she also found some uh, that were closed captions as well, I'm sorry, that were audio described captions as well, whereas they were able to then describe, uh, an, uh, a narrator was able to describe what was happening on the screen. And this was sort of an, uh, an eye-opening um, moment for many of their students because, again, in teaching and leadership is that they felt that this, the audio description was actually very beneficial for them to know what was actually happening with on the screen because um, one of the videos were, was talking about a particular practice that they were doing within uh, teacher leadership. Uh, and the audio description was able to support their learning by telling them exactly what was happening within the room. Um, and then UDL strategies to address the challenges. She looked at providing multiple means of action and expression. Again, that's the strategic network of the how of learning. And so to support student planning um, and that composition, she, she wanted to share weekly learning objectives. She also shared her guided notes, um, notes that she had um, to give out to students so that if um, she had more guided notes than they did. She, she understood what were the main key points that she was trying to do within her lecture um, or also within her lesson. She also found some graphic organizers um, from previous students that were in her class that used those graphic organizers to help um, uh, solidify the information within the lesson. Um, so, so previous students, and she was, you know, she was afforded that because she was in, in uh, uh, teaching leadership. Um, she was afforded uh, access to those um, previous students, <coughs> which was very helpful. And then the students also shared their ways of how they captured some information as well. Um, 
Alice is asking, who assisted Dr. Ringler in obtaining caption and described materials? Um, she kind of took it upon herself to do that, but she also had a graduate assistant in helping her um, with that. And, she, you know, we love graduate assistants, don't we? Um, and she gave the um, option for the graduate student because the graduate student was, was looking at um, teaching and learning um, within her curriculum and decided that maybe, you know, we need to, to beef up our media products in here. And so she found some audio described materials uh, online. Um, a good example, uh, a good resource, and I'm not sure if I had this on the back, is if you do an um, if you if you do a Google search on audio description. Sorry, I'm going to do that right now because I think it's important. Um, yeah, there's the. There's a few resources on here, and if somebody would want to take this on, they can do that. But there's, oh, here it is, the Audio Description Project uh, from the American Council for the, for the Blind. Um, they have some audio description uh, libraries and, and also some described titles of either movies. I'm going to put that in the, um, in the chat room so you can have that as a resource for you um, to look at. Um, and lastly, this is specifically with an online course. And I pulled this out because I think that, you know, classroom and online, you know, are hybrids. But then when you're also just teaching an online course, um, I think it's important that you add that personal touch um, to your courses. And providing, in this way, providing multiple means of action and expression is, you know, you use that syllabus to communicate a regular routines establish expectations, you know, timing, if you have synchronous or asynchronous um, types of um, classroom activities, um, how do you, you know, format assessments, you know, and other things. What this individual did was she um, uh, did a video tour of critical features within that course, online course. Uh, including support. So she used uh, different types of um, web tool, um, web showing tools, <coughs> excuse me, web showing tools to um, um, help with orientation within her classroom. But then she also did a video just of her in her home, did a, a few things uh, personal about her just to kind of make that personal connection. And I think sometimes we do use that, um, don't use that as as often as we should. And not only did that actually provide multiple means of action and expression within the um, online curriculum, but also shows a level of engagement. So if the professor or the instructor facilitator is able to you know, do a personal video, maybe one of the interactions could be that they also ask the uh, students to make a personal video uh, so that people can know exactly who's in their class, et cetera. Or whatever, it doesn't have to be a video, it could be um, a recording or something of that nature. Thank you for um, these resources within the chat room um, to Deanna and Chris. Um, great. And so Marvin, thank you. The CSU has a contract with Caption Sync for closed captions. Great. Um, you know, and I know that the CSU has a huge um, ATI effort, the Accessible Technology Initiative, to support um, those pieces. So I come to the question and answer time of our webinar. Um, which gives us about seven minutes for that. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, put it in the chat room. <coughs> um, I'm also going to, since I'm kind of waiting for some, for possible some questions, I'm going to just go quickly over some resources. So some of the resources you'll see on here is the UDL on campus.cast.org, which basically has a, a plethora of different types of resources and information on including universal design for learning within your courses. There's also a few accessibility checklists. Um, there's the WebAIM 508 standards. There's the WAVE web tool accessibility tool. There's also the WCAG 2 technical details. So I have those within. Um, the, the slides uh, and these resources. There's also some content creation resources um, in looking at accessibility in higher education. Um, WebAIM is a great resource um, to look at for accessibility. 
also VPAT, um, which is looking at the Information Technology Industry um, Council, or ITIC. Um, and if you go to that site, what I was trying to do that right now, um, there's the, the VPAT information, um, if I can spell it right, sorry. Um, it's, um, if you go directly to that policy and accessibility under the ITI or ITIC site, they have the VPAT, um, which is looking at the voluntary product accessibility template so that um, any type of um, vendor or whatever will have a, hopefully have a VPAT on how accessible their product is. <coughs> Excuse me. Then there's also um, the flexible learning um, for open education, the Flowey, the Three Play, um, BC Open Textbook Authoring Guide. So you you'll get you'll hopefully get these um, um, resources as we uh, go through this. Um, I'm just sort of reading some of the comments in the chat window. Um, Chris Smith is sharing uh, accessible online course content, great, under um, the HSA and documents and presentations, good. And Chris, there's also within, um, I, I'm not, I want to also add to that is that in the AIM, A-E-M dot cast dot O-R-G site, there's also, if you go under the heading for um, creating AIM, you'll see a bunch of uh, resources um, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for creating AIM, um, looking at um, best practices for educators and instructors. I'm gonna put that link directly in here um, so that you can look at those resources as well of how you can uh, get some checklists on PowerPoint, Excel, you know, PDF, um, a bunch of those. Uh, educational materials, also some SETA policy briefs, um, the state education, uh, state education technology um, um, component. Also, I have up here online is now um, up here on the slide is the CAST page, um, the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials page, and then also the National Center on UDL, uh, udlcenter.org which I believe is going to be changing um, hopefully soon. I know that CAST is working on redeveloping that um, uh, and updating it. Okay, so that's it. I hope this was helpful for you. Um, sorry, I'm trying to talk and read at the same time and you know that's hard. Um, Chris is an instructional designer with North Carolina Virtual Public Schools, and you're partnering with New York's Governor Moorhead Schools for the Blind to offer Spanish online, getting great feedback from them on digital accessibility. Great. I know that, um, and I've been um, looking at um, a trend within higher education and accessibility is that some of the uh, lead um, colleges and universities are actually offering um, positions for accessibility specialists. And sometimes I'm seeing that coming out of the IT department or um, from the diversity department. Um, so looking at how they can build in accessibility um, within their um, higher educational setting um, systemically. So not just looking at it from the students with disabilities resources or the students disabilities, you know, support services, but actually looking at from uh, building accessibility from a website point of view, and as we go into especially online information and how everything is becoming more online, is ensuring that accessibility is um, put together and addressed systemically. Um, so that takes us to the end, and it looks like um, the webinar survey is up there. So if you would please fill out um, the brief survey at that surveymonkey.com forward slash SCTD Cafe events, we would really appreciate your information, um, your evaluation of this. And if you have any suggestions for other presentations, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and you have my conf uh, information. Uh, I'm at Kirk ATP at 
www.outlook.com if you have any questions, comments, uh, or any feedback that you'd like to give me. And I'm going to put my email in that chat room. So again, thank you so much for your attention today, and um, I'll see you next time. Uh, so the um, Anna Maria, the survey link is not working. It says not found. Yeah. So I posted, sure. it in the, I posted it here in the chat. It seems not to be working from the link, but um, if you of course I see it now. Of course, sorry. No problem. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Kurt.